It's my pleasure to inaugurate the first Data Blitz presentation series that has been set up to showcase some of the excellent research conducted by our esteemed faculty at the Institute of Medical Science. In this order, the first speaker of the series is Dr. Howard Mount. Dr. Mount is a neuropharmacologist and associate professor in the departments of psychiatry, medicine, and physiology. He is also director of education in IMS, and along with Dr. Cindy Morset and myself, oversee the IMS degree programs. He is always keen to meet and advise prospective students interested in building a career across a broad range of IMS research disciplines. Howard began his own scientific career as a toxicologist, working in Ottawa with the National Research Council on environmental health effects of pyrethroid insecticides. Following up on an interest in their subtle and persistent effects in the brain led him, again over many years, through a series of questions related to the neurochemistry of brain development, memory, and mood. Howard is currently the principal investigator in the TAN CRND, where his research group uses genetically engineered mice to investigate mechanisms of brain cell death and to develop novel therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Mount to render his presentation. Good morning, so I'm just gonna correct one thing in the record. I'm not gonna talk about the research that I do. Rather, what I thought would be interesting this morning is to talk about what, some of the work being done in my lab, and specifically, the work being done by a recent PhD graduate from my lab, uh, Dr. Beverly Francis. And I thought that this might give you a sense of what's involved in doing a PhD in the IMS, uh, what types of questions you ask, what's the scope and breadth of, of the work for a PhD thesis. So um, Beverly came to my lab interested in Alzheimer's disease, and one in two people is going to have to deal with Alzheimer's disease. Either it'll affect you or it'll affect somebody very close to you, and you'll probably have a role as caregiver for um, somebody with Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common of the dementias. So, and as we age as a population, as we get increasing numbers of elderly people in our communities, uh, this is going to be more and more of a burden. So it's very important to understand how Alzheimer's develops and what drugs we might use to treat Alzheimer's disease. So when Bev came to the lab, she was interested in looking at the mechanisms underlying some of the cognitive dysfunction that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we had a remarkable tool in the lab, which is a transgenic mouse. This little guy is engineered so that he expresses in his genome two, uh, the human uh, amyloid precursor protein gene, engineered with two uh, mutations that make it more liable to produce sticky amyloid in the brain. And using this model, the TGCRND8 mouse, um, we know that they are plaques develop around three months of age. We know that there is spatial memory impairment in this, in this mouse. Uh, others uh, in Europe have shown that there is a loss of acetylcholine that occurs late in, in the, later in the life of this animal. Um, Bev, when she joined my lab as an uh, undergraduate project student, identified reductions in brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a factor that keeps neurons alive in the brain. And we also, uh, Bev and, and our lab, had shown that there is bioenergetic stress in this animal. So I'm going to go through some of the evidence for this, but there seemed to be a disconnect. Because, in fact, um, the loss of neurotransmitter, of acetylcholine, occurs at seven months. You can pick it up at seven months. And Bev wanted to know, well, you know, what's driving the early cognitive dysfunction in this animal if the acetylcholinergic neurons are alive? So to address this question, uh, Bev turned to uh, the mouse's innate interest in novelty. If you put a mouse in a box, with a, a Lego construct, whoops, what am I doing here? With a Lego construct and a Hot Wheels car, the mouse will explore both. If you then take the mouse back to its home cage, give it a little rest, either five minutes, an hour, or three hours, put it back in the box, but switch out one of the objects, the animal will explore preferentially the new object and ignore the familiar. 
You can create a memory index of novel object memory by looking at the difference in exploration time as a function of the total time exploring objects. And this is called the memory, uh, object memory index. Now, if you look at the retention of that memory, uh, you will find that there's actually a wonderful correlation between the retention of that memory and the thickness of an area called the entorhinal cortex, where amyloid pathology begins and where degeneration begins in Alzheimer mice. So what happens in this TG78 mouse that has the human amyloid, sticky amyloid accumulating in the brain? Well, she found that as early as eight weeks of age, there was impairment of early object memory, which is largely encoded in entorhinal cortex. And with a five minute delay, you can see from the black bars and all of my talk are going to be the TG78 mouse relative to the control, which is gray. And you can see that with a five minute delay, the mouse really didn't remember as well as the control, which object was, uh, was familiar. After a three hour delay, there was basically no memory, it was as though the animal didn't, hadn't been exposed to the objects. If we looked at slightly older animals at six to, well, much older, actually, six to eight months, they're basically, their object memory was gone. So what she concluded from this was that, in fact, memory deficits occur much earlier than had been expected. And along with that, she showed some evidence for behavioral despair, a model of depression. And I'll get to that later. But this was extremely early in, in a mouse model, and it and begged the question of well, what's driving this? What chemical changes in the brain might account for um, these changes? And specifically, she thought, what would be happening in the areas that serve memory functions, the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus? Well, when she looked at the hippocampus and at the cortex in these animals, she found that there was a decrease in the level of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, this factor that keeps a number of neuronal types uh, healthy all through life. And it's known in Alzheimer patients that BDNF is decreased. And she had shown previously that in very aged animals, BDNF was down in these animals. But it appears to be an early change in the brain. So the question became, what about the transmitter systems that, um, that are responsible, that are kept alive and kept functioning by BDNF? And the catecholaminergic uh, and indolaminergic transmitters, the biogenic amines, this would be dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, these uh, transmitters arrive from cell bodies in the uh, brainstem and in the midbrain, and they project long distances up to the cortex and the hippocampus to throughout the brain, basically. These are are neurons with very long projections, and um, we know that they play a role both in depressive phenotypes and in object memory from other work in the laboratory. So we asked, are, are these transmitter systems affected uh, coincident with the change in behavioral impairment. And to address this question, we used a unique technology, which is uh, uh, basically heat fixation of the brain. We used a snazzy Rube Goldberg type microwave, which you see at the top, to uh, instantaneously fix the live brain in less than one second with a pulse of microwave energy. And what you see beside that are, is the result. You see a fresh brain on one side and the other the cooked brain. Now, wh why would you want to cook the brain? The idea is to inactivate all enzymatic activity, inactivate any, any uh, decay, basically, prevent any decay of analytes that you might want to measure. Analytes like ATP or metabolites of, of noradrenaline and dopamine, which um, can give you an index of the amount of transmitter being released. Now, how do we measure the transmitters? We can dissect that heat-fixed brain using HPLC, and down below you see some traces. So looking at these major three transmitter systems that innervate the areas of interest, we looked at what might be happening to transmitters. And what we Bev found, and I should just mention, she did this in collaboration with Jim Ao Yang in my lab, who you see perched beside the, the HPLC machine. What she found was that noradrenaline was reduced in all of the major terminal fields of the TGCRND8 mouse, and particularly uh, in the hippocampus and the uh, frontal cortex. And she found that there was progressive degeneration of the noradrenergic afferent, suggesting that the loss of noradrenaline, the early loss of noradrenaline in this model might account for some of the impairment that we see. She also looked at measures of bioenergetic stress and uh, again, using this microwave fixed tissue, she's actually able to measure ATP in specific brain areas to get a sense of bioenergetic charge of how the 
mitochondria are doing at keeping up with the energy demands of the tissue. She found not only an impairment, a, a loss of ATP, which is basically not uh, conducive to life, at 16 weeks in the hippocampus, uh, she also found a, a, um, that this uh, was most likely caused by a failure of complex one in the electron transport chain. And when she looked at complex one activity in the mitochondria, she found a significant drop in complex one activity, suggesting that, um, that uh, this may in fact be driving some of the energetic failure and death of the brain cells. So um, she found that this was uniquely complex one in the electron transport chain when she looked at other uh, other enzyme complexes within the, comp within the mitochondria, she found that, in fact, their activity was not infected. So the question became, what might account for that specific targeting of complex one? And through a series of experiments, she looked at various protein subunits of the complex one in the mitochondria, and she was able to identify NDUFB8, which is a protein that, that links uh, cytochrome C, um, uh, with the complex, and she was able to show that this was, in fact, uh, reduced in the, in the TG78 brain. So circling back now to what might be driving all this, uh, Bev was interested in knowing, uh, you know, if noradrenaline's dropping off, what happens if we increase noradrenaline in the, in the brain? Can we do anything about bioenergy? Can we do anything about the amyloid load? Can we do anything about BDNF? Can we do anything about behavior? And to examine this question, she went to, a, she used a really neat strategy in my mind. Uh, she used a presynaptic um, autoceptor, a alpha-2 receptor, noradrenergic receptor, on the terminals of noradrenergic neurons. Now, what did these presynaptic receptors do? They regulate the amount of noradrenaline released in a synapse. If you block them, you basically have no uh, control over, the, you lose control over the loss of, of the release of noradrenaline from the, ter from the terminal. In other words, you turn up the amount of noradrenaline being released. So she used this presynaptic antagonist, dexafuroxan, um, to block the presynaptic noradrenaline, uh, norepinephrine shown here, uh, receptors, the alpha-2 receptors, and thereby increase uh, noradrenaline. The advantage of this strategy is that it, these presynaptic receptors, noradrenergic receptors, are also present on cholinergic ter terminals. So by blocking those receptors, you also turn up the amount of acetylcholine that's lost later in life. So her strategy involved implanting osmotic mini pumps uh, under the skin of these animals, and this systemically released uh, the drug over prolonged periods, and she did a month of treatment to examine uh, the effects of, of increasing noradrenergic tone in the brain. And what she found was really quite astonishing to us. Um, on, on the far left, what you see is a measure of, of behavioral despair. It's basically immobility of a mouse hung by its tail. Uh, at some point, you stop struggling when you're hung by a piece of masking tape from your, your, your tail. Um, and in fact, this is a, an assay used routinely in the drug industry to assess uh, depression-like uh, behaviors. And, and what you were able to see is that the duration of, of immobility uh, in the um, TGCR98 mouse on the extreme left is actually very high. In other words, uh, they give up right away. They just hang immobile until you take them off the stand. If you give them the drug dexafuroxan, they're right back like controls. They're right ready to go. They're going to try to struggle, get away. So in other words, we've addressed the behavioral despair with the drugs. And the, the other compound you see, ribostigmine, targets acetylcholine. So it increases the amount of acetylcholine. Similarly, if we go back to that memory index and object memory, and we look at the bottom panel here, we'll see that, again, no object memory in the TGCR88 mouse but you hit them with a bit of the dexafuroxan for a month, and you basically correct the behavioral impairment in the mice. Well, what about mitochondria? Again, we, we have shown you earlier that the ATP is reduced in the hippocampus of the TG78 mouse. If you administer dexafuroxan chronically, you, you correct the uh, loss in ATP. And indeed, you also increase uh, complex one activity in the brain with dexafuroxan administration over here, without affecting, down here, the number of mitochondria in the tissue. And BDNF, what about that? 
Again, BDNF is reduced even in a fairly young mouse, 16 weeks of age. If you give dexafuroxan, you compare BDNF levels to a non-transgenic mouse, you see that you've corrected the, the deficit in BDNF. So in summary, what uh, Bev's work demonstrated, I think fairly compellingly in the mouse model of Alzheimer's, is that noradrenergic deficits probably do contribute to the amyloid-induced impairment in this mouse model of, of uh, pathology. Uh, clearly, amyloid uh, pathology is associated with a loss of the noradrenergic terminals, and uh, that in turn by mechanisms which we're currently exploring, affects behavior, BDNF uh, expression, but also the mitochondrial stress in the animals. And a, a fairly straightforward strategy of targeting these, these on-off switches on the noradrenergic terminals appears to restore memory, alleviate the behavioral despair, and increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor uh, levels in the brain. Now, you've, you've obviously heard that, uh, the, about the problems with translating from mouse studies to human. And the field of Alzheimer's has been particularly fraught with difficulties in the sense that many drugs that have worked in uh, mice haven't worked when we've gone to the clinic, into clinical trials. Um, I, I can tell you where we're at in terms of the uh, approaching these alpha-2 receptors in Alzheimer's disease right now. It actually has, is one of the few uh, approaches that seems to be uh, yielding some fruit. Uh, the initial clinical trials done by Orion Pharmaceuticals with an alpha-2 antagonist actually were very promising, and right now they've moved to a phase three trial, and it does appear that these compounds have effects on memory in humans, which is what we would have predicted by the um, by the studies that we've done in mice. The trick for us now as academic researchers is to try to understand the mechanisms and try to see how we can tweak these so as to improve the effect. And we anticipate that as in all drug discoveries, this is going to be an iterative process where we go back to the drawing board many times with different compounds that targeting these molecules and try to become more and more specific and, and in our stra therapeutic strategy. So I just wanted to, again, uh, mention this is, was the PhD work in a nutshell of Dr. Beverly Francis and assisted by other people in my laboratory, in particular Dr. Uh, Mr. J uh, Jimmy Yao, um, and, um, and also a number of collaborators who have participated uh, in this work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.